Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of American Rambler. I'm your host, Colin Woodward. Thank you for listening to the podcast. On today's show, I have historian Michael Belial, and I hope I pronounced that last name correctly. We did go over it before we began our interview. Michael Belial is on the show today. Michael is the author of a new book. It is called Inventing Equality, Reconstructing the Constitution in the Aftermath of the Civil War. It was published back in 2020, St. Martin's Press. You can get that online. The cover price is about $28.99, a little bit more in Canada. But check that out. It is a good book. It is well written. And Michael does not mince words about certain characters in American history, especially uh, James Henry Hammond at one point is mentioned in the book. And if you know American history, you know a little bit about Senator Hammond of South Carolina. But uh, it is a well-researched book and has a lot to say about citizenship and how that has evolved over time and how maybe we misunderstand that topic, largely because it's not really defined in the Constitution. And obviously we've had a number of amendments addressing citizenship uh, and voting that came after the Civil War, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments, but uh, we had women's voting later. So they kind of all get wrapped up into this idea of citizenship and what that right entails and who should get it. And we are certainly still grappling with that topic today. So we're going to talk about Michael's book as well as his other work. And when you're talking to Michael, you have to talk about the book Arming America that came out in 2000. At least you have to talk about it if you're going to talk about his entire life and career. And that's how I like to do this podcast. I don't like to just talk about one book or one one subject necessarily. I like to talk to people about what they've done throughout their career and how things have been received and what their process is. And if you know about Arming America, you will know how controversial that book was, putting it mildly. It was a very controversial book back in 2000 when I was in graduate school. I saw that unfolding in real time, and things got pretty gnarly. It was a book about the history of gun culture in America, talking about the origins of the gun culture. I mean, certainly we live in a gun culture today. The day that Michael and I talked, I believe there had been a mass shooting that day. We've had a number since then. I'm recording this on April 16th. We had another one in Indianapolis, but in the last few weeks, there's been the one in Atlanta, Colorado, and there have been other instances of police shootings. So there are no shortage of stories about guns and violence in this country, but Michael wrote a book about this back in 2000, and He was the subject of a very vicious campaign by the NRA and other gun rights advocates. And I can't go into the details of it. I will refer you to Dan Galata's podcast that he did with Michael about Arming America, where I think he just talks about that book with Michael. But uh, it is a, a story that deserves its own documentary, as Dan has suggested, uh, and, and you should check out Dan's podcast, The Age of Jackson, which is terrific. But Dan said there should be a documentary about Arming America, and I agree with him, or maybe a podcast series along the lines of some of the stuff that uh, This American Life does. But it is a it is a big book, Arming America, and the the attacks on it were really serious, had serious consequences for Michael, who was teaching at the time and had to resign his position and didn't hear from him for a while, but he started writing books again. He's written a number of books since Arming America came out. Uh, Eventing Equality is his most recent one, but he's written about the Reconstruction period in a book, 1877. He's also He also has a book on the American military So he has been productive, and he is retired now, but I had a nice chat with him. Michael is a very engaging guy, and, you know, whatever you think of Arming America or his other books, he has tackled some major topics 
in American historiography and definitely has something interesting to say. And, and as I said, he, he writes well. So Inventing Equality, uh, you should enjoy reading it and get something out of that. It's taken me a while to edit this podcast. Uh, a lot has been going on in my life that I won't get into now. Uh, nothing bad necessarily, but just busy and April feels like it's on fast forward. So I've been lagging behind in my editing duties. And now that I have some guests lined up for April and May, I've, I've got to get on this. So didn't want to wait any longer. This is April 16th and it's been a while since my last podcast. So I, I need a personal assistant, I think. So if there are any shady department heads out there who want to throw an intern my way, I, I think I can find some work for him or her. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm just going to have to work on doing this by my lonesome. I hope you will enjoy this, my talk with Michael Belial. Is marijuana legal in Connecticut yet? Not yet. Actually, it's funny you ask that. I've, I've um, got a pretty good relationship with our state representative, and she has just introduced that legislation before our Judiciary Committee. Okay. So hopefully later this year. Because <laughs> we just passed the, the law in Virginia, and... I know! That's so, so amazing! So, if, you know... Uh, people want to make a road trip to Virginia soon once the dispensaries are up. I I don't know how long that's going to take, but uh, no, I mean, there's definitely been some changes with the Democratic legislature that we have and the Democratic governor. And of course, just annoys Republicans to no end. But, um, you know, I mean, it's been legal and or decriminalized in D.C., whatever it is. So, I mean, if you go to D.C., you can get it there. And, you know, I think we're trying to hold our hold the mantle of being the most progressive southern state for whatever that's worth. Well, you're more progressive than Connecticut in a few regards. Well, that's interesting because I'm originally from Massachusetts and my family's still there. And my sister actually works at a marijuana distributor, whatever it is. Uh, she's been there a couple months. So it's kind of snowballing. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's been legal for a number of years there, but you know, yeah, not, not surprisingly, Massachusetts leading the way with that. Yeah. Well, if you cross the border into Great Barrington, you see all the, you, there's a dispensary there and you see all these Connecticut license plates. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> their tax base, which is very thoughtful of us. I'm sorry, where in Massachusetts are you from? I'm from Worcester County, a small town. Really? I used to live in Worcester. Oh, yeah? What were you doing there? Yeah. I was at the American Antiquarian Society um, for um, for a year. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a great place to do research. That's an amazing place to do research. I really liked it. And I just uh, just decided I'd settle in Worcester and get a sense of it. And I, I liked it a lot. Well, that's good to hear. It's it's a little beat up, and people from Boston make fun of it. It's kind of the redheaded stepchild of uh, Massachusetts cities, you know. Um, but hey, you know, I grew up around there. We always went there. You know, like everybody would work there, so it wasn't that far. And there's stuff to do when you're a teenager, certainly. But um, I know, I guess it's 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 kind of been holding its own. I mean, it never quite descended as far as some cities. I mean, like Hartford got really bad. For, oh, I know. You know, I mean... It's it's bouncing back a little bit. That's good. Yeah. When I lived in Worcester, they were trying to reinvent it, and they had a slogan, which was Worcester, the Paris of the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just love that. <laughs> and by Paris, they mean Paris, Texas, I think. I know <laughs> which one. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I, I certainly have a soft spot for Worcester. I mean, you know, compared to other places I lived, it's it's definitely got its advantages. But um, yeah, I mean, Boston just looms so large. It's it's obviously the biggest city, but just the media presence there is is so huge. So everything we watched was Boston stations and reading the Boston journalists and stuff. So, you know, it's not that big of a state. So you can feel like you're from Boston, even if, if you're not. I mean, living in, I've lived in Virginia for a while. And I mean, compared to other states, Virginia is not one of the biggest states, but it just kind of blows my mind how big Virginia is. I mean, there are parts that I've never been to. Lynchburg, you know, I've never been there. It's a pretty big city. So 
Uh, there's certainly a lot of ground to cover, but yeah, I mean, even in New England, as small as it is, if you go, you go north of Massachusetts, you're you're pretty much in the woods. I mean, I know. <laughs> I used to live in Vermont, and oh. I, I really, I was, and I really felt like I had stepped back in time in many ways. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's it's very rural. New Hampshire, same deal. Maine, I don't know what's going on in Maine. It's Stephen King country. You got to you gotta stick to the beaches up there. Yeah, um, no, you're right. Um, so, well, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. And to you. I'm, I'm going to make a pistachio cake later so we have something green. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a proponent of green beer. Yeah, uh, my, my, I have two young daughters so they they were pretty excited today and i got my green on i loved being a being a father of a when it was just so exciting to raise a child it was a unique experience um i really enjoyed it yeah i i kind of came in late to the game a bit i mean i was like in my late 30s and <laughs> me too yeah. Uh, well, I was I, I heard an interview of, with you, Hugh Grant the other day, and he was 51, I think, when he started having kids, which... Oh, my God. I don't know about that, but... Um, <laughs> I just needed naps by the time I took it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's getting up there. Um, I feel like I waited too long, and you know, I was still 37 or, or whatever it was. Um, Nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> you had- so are you from the West Coast? Yeah, Los Angeles. Okay. Yeah, because I saw you, you did your school in, at UC Santa Cruz, and you went to UC Irvine. Yeah, and that's right. So you, you like uh, you obviously like Southern California. You want to do your schooling there. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, I, I left Los Angeles the first chance I got. Really? <laughs> did it, did it, and still don't really like Los Angeles, but... Um, uh, I love public universities. Uh, my tuition at UC Santa Cruz was one hundred and thirty seven dollars and fifty cents. Um, yeah, that is notable. And uh, after I graduated, I, I went through college in three years and then I went off to Europe and came back in uh, 81 because my mother uh, uh, developed cancer and was dying. And I got a full scholarship fellowship uh, what was it called the regents fellowship at uc irvine how could i resist well you know i've talked to people on the podcast who went to school in the, the 60s or 70s and i mean as you say there's a huge difference between tuition then and tuition now um but i think it's criminal i the logic not to get off topic sure. we haven't got but but the logic of public education and public universities was always that you were making a sacrifice as a student going to college. You were giving up four years of possible income and developing seniority within any kind of job, whether you're, um, you know, my father worked on docks, my mother was a secretary, right? Um, I could have gone into well, what I did. I was a bartender. I could have done that and made money, but I was supposed to sacrifice that by improving myself and benefiting society, right? And so the tuition should be nominal. Now we have this attitude that it's an incredible privilege to go to even a public university, and you should go deeply in debt for the rest of your damn life in order to pay for it, because that's for you. But it's society that benefits, and you still, as a student, give up so much to go off to college. It makes me, as you can tell, furious that this is our attitude right now. I mean, I'm not sure when the shift occurred exactly. Maybe it was kind of happening because my first year of college was 93, and I went to Trinity, which is a pretty expensive school. Because my first year of college was 93, and I went to Trinity, which is a pretty expensive school. And you went to Trinity in Hartford? I went to Trinity in Hartford, yeah. I taught there. That's wonderful. Yeah, I saw that you had taught there. When were you teaching there? Oh, let's see. Um, until I retired. <laughs> let's see, 20, 2010 to 2015, something like that. Okay. Um, okay. I hate to admit that I'm – what year is this? <laughs> uh, no, I taught 2016. <laughs> okay. 2016. Yeah. Yeah, I knew you were in Connecticut, and I knew you had taught at Trinity, but I was I, – I mean, I was assuming it was – fairly recently um because yeah. i haven't been back 
to campus for a while. I've I've had let's see, I had Frank Kirkpatrick on the podcast from the religion department, uh-huh. and he's retired now. So I think there are a few professors I had there still there. I think Sam Casso is still teaching there. But yeah. um, my advisor, Jack Chatfield, he died a while back. And yeah, I remember. So, you know, just that's, that's how it goes. But um, yeah, I mean, when I was there, was, I think it was starting, you're starting to see that astronomical rise in college tuition. Yeah. And so for grad school, I went to a state school, which was fairly for, affordable LSU, but the stipends was also low. And, you know, if you work part time or something, it's going to be a minimum wage job and you're not going to have as much time to focus on your studies. So I think yeah. that that discussion is starting to happen. I know you, you have a daughter. Did she go to college? Oh yeah. She went to Smith and, oh, okay. and, and Oxford and Oxford, <laughs> Oxford borderline free. Um, the comparison with Europe is, is really remarkable. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's a professor now actually. Oh, where's she teaching? Taiwan, Taiwan national university. Oh, cause you, well, I I t- I worked at Smith for a year, um, but um, did you? Yeah, because you you had mentioned in email you were doing something Taiwan related. What was that? All, what was that about? As you may know from the newspapers, um, China has been making very aggressive uh, motions towards absorbing Taiwan in one way or another, and the Taiwanese have recently become fascinated with the whole subject of citizenship. Um, it has long-term significance. Uh, how do we define it? And Taiwan also has a background of, um, shall we say, uh, negative relations with their indigenous population, the Formosan people. And um, so they're, they're searching for an understanding of citizenship, which is based on free choice instead of on ethnicity, nationality, um, and such. And of course, the United States, as James Kettner, one of my favorite um, people pointed out in his brilliant book on citizenship, the United States invented that. They invented the concept that citizenship is a choice. So I was in a uh, uh, large conversation about the meaning of citizenship um, and where it may be going into the future and about how citizenship can be weaponized, uh, which also is unfortunately something the United States invented. Yeah. Well, I want to get to your book and in, in- there is a lot of discussion of, of that question of citizenship, which, you know, I, I urge people to read this book um, Thank you. for a lot of reasons. But also this I think maybe we take a lot of things for granted with citizenship. I think we certainly yes. uh, have been through a four year process with Trump where, you know, kind of citizenship came in question. But if you go back to the Constitution, even it's it's kind of left very vague in terms of how that's defined and. And yeah. all that, but I want to get to that in a little bit. But okay, so you was this through? Did your daughter sort of arrange this to talk about Taiwan because she's over yes. there? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, and China certainly has been in the news lately about you know, with Hong Kong, the Hong Kong protests, and they right. sort of swallowed up Hong Kong, and I think now they have their their sights set on Taiwan. Precisely. So, and if you read, read the Taiwanese newspapers, they, they have two English newspapers that you can read online, you get a rather different perspective, of course, of these events, um, under which basically the movement by the Chinese government, by their surveillance state into Hong Kong, is a preliminary um, to an effort to establish the same sort of relationship with Taiwan, um, to essentially annex it into greater China. Um, and this would, of course, reinforce their claims to essentially own the South China Sea, which would be very upsetting to uh, Vietnam and the Philippines as well. So it, this, these are huge issues of real significance, I think, on a global level. And so who were you, who were you exactly talking to? Oh, in that pot, in that uh, conversation, it was a... Um, what do we call it? A um, like a round table where they had scholars from different countries with different perspectives on citizenship. Um, German, Irish, uh, tr- uh, someone from Turkey. It was really a fascinating comparative study, in my opinion, on th- this issue because we we kind of ex- what you said a moment ago. We kind of accept citizenship as a concept if we have it. But if you don't have it, if you're an immigrant or a refugee 
um, a displaced person, it takes on enormous significance. And the standards are very different. Um, Germany, for instance, uh, famously requires German heritage in order to become a German citizen, or at least they did. Uh, Marco recently um, has pushed through some changes in the nationalization laws. But that is essentially what uh, Roger Taney wanted to establish with the Dred Scott decision. It wasn't simply that he was excluding blacks from citizens, citizenship. If you read his decision, he said it was essentially for the posterity of those who wrote and ratified the Constitution back in the 17, uh, late 1780s. So immigrants would not be eligible for citizenship either. They would essentially have to marry into uh, native-born families who were white and over time, over a couple of generations, they might be able to claim citizenship. This is a vision that Taney had that would have changed the very nature of the United States. It would have made it immigrant hostile in the long run. Yeah, well, Taney's definitely someone that has not aged well <laughs> in terms of uh, his, his legacy. They took down that statue in... Maryland a few years back he was I remember of, yes. the first the first to go and I mean in terms of people that have, you know have done harm in this country it, you know be hard pressed to find a judge who who caused more harm than than Tawny did um yeah but is that how his name is pronounced excuse me I never have really known I, I think so yeah at least that's okay. that's what I've I've been taught um let's go with that okay well, <laughs> um with, with Tawny Tani, of course, to give him the benefit of sincerity, from his perspective, even though he warped both legal precedent and history to serve his purposes, he thought he was solving the problem right. that the Constitution had created was its failure to define citizenship. And so he was going to find it. He was going to find it very narrowly, but it would be, he felt, the solution and would thus avoid future conflict by, you know, if we return to the Constitutional Convention, Governor Morris said, um, we have to choose between human rights and property rights. You, you, have, you have to emphasize one or the other. If you emphasize human rights, then you can't own people. But if you emphasize property rights, you negate human rights. And Tani essentially thought he was correct and that we should be emphasizing property rights, that those are the rights that matter, and those are the ones that must be defended, even to the exclusion, again, of any notion of quality, human freedom. These things must take a back seat to our rights in property. Yeah. No, and obviously, you know, slavery's been abolished for a long time and everything, but I think that that view of property rights is still very strong in this country. I mean, I don't know if it goes back to British and their sense of property rights, but I think obviously the settling of America had a lot to do with, well, you know, we own the land so we can do what we want and indigenous people don't have a deed essentially. So it doesn't belong to them or we can take it from them as long as we have, you know, the proper paperwork. And of course, I'm oversimplifying just a bit here, but um, I think that still holds true a lot. Um, I mean, anyone that's signed a contract in this country and been screwed over by it, you, you kind of have first firsthand experience with that. Absolutely. And, and I think you're right. It does go back to English common law notions of absolute rights and property. Um, and the very fact that when the English came to America, they, North America, they established a principle that the land was empty, it was virgin soil, because the native population didn't have property rights. This was essentially a myth that they constructed, but the natives could not produce documents showing that they owned the land, and that's what mattered. What mattered were the documents that indicated a right of ownership. And if you extend that logic to people, which English common law certainly did until 1772, you have, again, this notion of an absolute legal right to own another person. And it extends further and further till you get to the um, what Blackstone 
notoriously called the right of coverture, where essentially a woman has no legal identity, um, pretty much period. But once she gets married, she is subject to coverture. She's covered by her husband and her legal identity dissipates, it just vanishes. Uh, this also is a right of ownership where the husband has a basically complete rights over um, the actions and income and very body of his wife. So yes, this is a very powerful set of legal precedents, but the United States was moving away from a number of these common law heritage precedents in the especially in the 1840s and tani was definitely responding to that he was reacting to it um forcing the country to go back to this notion of property rights and as you suggest it's a straight line from that through the citizens united decision um, to take the 14th amendment which establishes that all persons born or naturalized in the united states are subject to the jurisdiction thereof etc um and have equal rights before the law, and to establish that, in a sense, property is a citizen. Property has citizenship rights. Corporations have freedom of speech. Therefore, money is literally talks. Um, and that is where we are right now in our country, that this recognition of the supremacy of property rights. Yeah. For sure. Well, I want to go back a little bit because you said you grew up in Los Angeles. You didn't like it, but you did. <laughs> <laughs> I I feel like people kind of have a love hate relationship with L.A. They either right love the weather, the sunshine. You know, there's obviously a lot to do. Entertainment industry is there and stuff, but people that don't like it really seem to hate it. But you you're kind of a native, but you did study there. Who did you study with at UC Irvine? Oh, uh, Christine Hireman. Okay. Was my advice. And then Jack, Jack Diggins and Michael Johnson were the, my other two lead professors. Um, wonderful trio to have. Uh, I will say that John Wiener was an enormous influence on um, my scholarly development. He taught a year-long course on historical theory, which I have to admit I really hadn't encountered beforehand. I entered college and as an undergraduate as a math major. Um, and graduated with a math major, um, never had encountered historical theory in the way that um, Professor Wiener uh, presented it. It was a fabulous experience. And uh, of course, Professor Hireman uh, was inspirational in all ways. Well, it's interesting, uh, John Wiener, because he's had a pretty varied career in terms of what he's written about. I think we read a book yes. on the populace that he had written, and then he did a book on John Lennon and the FBI. So he and then his latest book is with Mike Davis on uh, L.A. in the 1960s. Okay. So, I mean, I'm I'm kind of seeing a theme with with your your books overall. Um, what was it you were writing about as a grad student? What was your dissertation about? I was very much focused on religious history. I was fascinated by the notion that. Um, American religious diversity emerges on the frontier. And I was focusing on that, um, on the Vermont frontier, because it was so chaotic. It created so many opportunities. And I certainly would be delighted to get into the specifics sure. of that research, um, because I, find, I found it and still find it very exciting. It's one of the most remarkable qualities of the United States as a nation is that from its beginning, there was this room to not only practice pre-existing denominations across the spectrum in many of the uh, states, because not all states had this attitude. Connecticut, of course, still had an official religion until 1818, which was congregationalism. But in most of the areas of the new United States, you could practice pretty much any pre-existing religion and create your own. Universalism, for instance, emerges on the Vermont frontier. And later on, of course, a native-born Vermonter invents another religion, which is Mormonism. Um, and I just think this is a marvelous aspect to this country, one I, I uh, respect deeply. And I think it emerges from the opportunities created when people moved 
to areas that didn't have pre-existing governmental uh, political structures and could create their own. They, they could craft essentially a, a state and ultimately a nation that matches the architecture of their desires. Uh, and I think Vermont very much did that. And that's what my book, my first book, Revolution They Outlaws, was about, was how they created a state that matched what they thought was a model of political and social organization. Yeah, um, I saw that you, you, you're you uh, discussing the revolution in, in your first book, which uh, that was based on your dissertation. So you finished that, then you published the UVA. So the first book, you, you get that published, you are at Emory. You had the teaching job there. And then your next book is, is Arming America, correct? No, actually, I had a book called Lethal Imagination in there with NYU Press. Okay, um, okay. I, well, I, I edited a, a number of other books along the way. Okay. And uh, so if you want a monograph, yeah, I would say uh, Arming America came next. What was Lethal Imagination about? Uh, about American violence. okay. So is that kind of where you make this a, shift? Because it seems like you... Yeah, you that's kind of, exactly okay. right. I became... After I finished uh, Revolutionary Outlaws, I was going to go back and study religion. And I was looking in a lot of probate records, looking for religious books. That's one of the things I wanted to sort of figure out is what were the... Were there intellectual influences beyond the Bible in the creation of religion on the frontier? And it was just this sudden moment when I realized I wasn't seeing guns. And I have a heritage with guns, using them, <laughs> and skeet shooting, uh, to be very specific, and target shooting. And um, I was intrigued by that. And then I was intrigued also by this notion, looking through court records that I wasn't seeing a lot of violence in the, on the frontier, not interpersonal violence. And, you know, obviously a lot of that could be a failure of recording. Certainly not all violent crimes find their way into court records, but nonetheless, it's incredible that entire years could pass without any indication of interpersonal violence outside of, you know, warfare. So I became first interested in violence and its influence in American history and how it, how we go through these cycles of increased violence and lesser violence. And then I started to wonder, would well, guns have anything to do with this? Does the presence of ever more firearms around the time of the U.S. Civil War influence interpersonal violence. Um, so that's where I started with uh, Arming America. You, you talked about the book with, with Dan uh, Galata, and you got pretty deep in the weeds there. And I know there's been a lot said about it, a lot written about it. So I don't want I don't necessarily want to go down every rabbit hole with that, but, <laughs> but it's, it's an important... Me neither. <laughs> but it certainly is an important book in, in terms of how much publicity it generated, but you had you had started with this book Lethal, um, Lethal Imagination, and you'd written some articles be, that were published before Arming America came out. I I heard or, or you said somewhere that people were starting to attack your research before Arming America even came out. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Certainly. Um... This is how I actually first encountered the web, uh, which I had only vaguely heard of. It was after uh, an article appeared in the Journal of American History that I received a phone call from someone I didn't know um, who was on a chat group, an NRA chat group, and he thought, I should know what they were talking about. And he said he offered to send me um, some printouts of their conversation, which he did. And there was an effort to organize a footnote by footnote verification of everything in, 
in the articles I had written in the 1990s, looking for errors, looking for ways to attack my research. And then also to arrange for people to go to talks I was giving at various academic venues um, to take notes and perhaps ask pointed questions. And I just thought this was very peculiar. I had never encountered anything <laughs> like this before. Yeah. And well, so I got on, I, I hate to admit how ignorant I was. Um, I got a, the tech person for the college to come in and set me up on the World Wide Web, as we called it then, and um, create some accounts for me. And I started joining some chat groups and discovering that there was a lot of animosity to the research I was doing bef well before Army in America came out, two, two years before I had even submitted the manuscript. Um, they were preparing to attack the book. And I did not understand it for a number of reasons. And I must say, one of them was I have always considered myself a Burkean conservative. I was a huge fan of Edmund Burke's notions of organic change over time and of the supremacy of the law. I still believe that the only thing that holds society together is respect for the law, though the law must be equal to all, um, which I'm not sure Bur how Burke felt about that. He, he had different opinions at different times. But nonetheless, I thought I was going back into American history and countering the left-wing historical vision of the United States as a land essentially of murderers. Um, when I was writing in the 1990s, there was this trend to really denigrate early Americans as borderline homicidal maniacs who would go to the frontier mostly so they could kill Indians. And I just didn't think this was an accurate description based on source documents. So I actually thought people in the gun culture would be fascinated with the origin story and how the um, early gun owners were not homicidal maniacs. Um, and in fact, there was not that much gun ownership in early America up until um, the introduction of mass production of firearms um, just before the Civil War by Samuel Colt, which really takes off during the Civil War and the widespread availability of firearms. And the very fact that the National Rifle Association was organized in 1871 in order to supply training and safety in the use of firearms. I thought, I thought it was a coherent narrative which would actually please gun owners. I cannot believe how wrong I was. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, you know, what you're talking about is like, before your book even comes out, people are attending your talks or saying they're going to parcel your footnotes for an academic that is virtually unheard of. I mean, when I was in grad school, Arming America came out and I was hearing about what was happening uh, to you in the book. And it was it was terrifying because I think it was sort of a perfect storm of we had this sort of political sea change in America post Gingrich, post Republican Revolution, um, where I think there's this concerted effort by the NRA and other gun groups to kind of create this orthodoxy with their ideology, their propaganda, whatever it is. And they were going to do whatever they could to just destroy this book. And again, I know I don't I don't want to get into you know, all the weeds with it. Um, you, I know you've, you've said a lot about it, but, you know, kind of looking back, how, how do you sort of frame it? I mean, do you, do you feel like, what do you think the main intention was behind? Was there a deeper political intention behind this campaign? I guess is what I'm asking. That's an excellent question. And I think sometimes historians want to imagine future historians, how they will look back 
at our current time and frame in the larger context the issues that we live on a daily basis. And I look back now and what I see over the past 20 years, maybe 25, is a shift that's accelerated because of the web toward distinctive ways of knowledge, shall we say, to put it as objectively as I can, that there are those on the web who want to construct alternate understandings of reality based upon their ideologies rather than upon the empirical evidence. So to be more specific, I do think that right around the year 2000 to about 2004, those who we might identify as on the political and social right wing in the United States recognized that the web was a marvelous tool and weapon for reframing just about any issue that you can think of to create competing cultures of knowledge in the United States. So for me, and obviously I'm too close to the subject to have a truly objective perspective, but from my perspective, I do see a straight line from the coordinated efforts before a book even comes out to attack and damage its credibility through to the swift boat attacks on John Kerry in 2004 through to QAnon today. Well, I just talked to Frank Smith, a journalist who just has written a book about the NRA, and he kind of tracks there's a shift in the in the NRA and this isn't secret knowledge but in in the late 70s there's a a shift and I think it's called the Cincinnati revolt or something like that where 1977 okay they, they shifted from being a um uh shall we say a sporting group to being a political group it's it's extremely significant moment yes and the NRA goes back to the 1870. I think it was founded in 1871 in New York, which is kind of surprising to people today. You'd maybe think it is something that started in the the Deep South or the Midwest or something, but is actually a New York organization for for target target shooters. Essentially, is is how it started. Um, um, so Frank has written this book, and I have not read it yet, but he kind of tracks the history and that there's certainly some mythology with the NRA. Uh, about their early history. Some people have gotten it wrong, like Michael Moore and, and other people on the left. Uh, but there's definitely the shift in the late 70s. And I think you do see this emerging kind of fundamentalism around the, the gun rights issue. You got caught in the crosshairs, pardon the pun. Um, but I think, I mean, it's safe to say that in the last 20 years, the, the pro-gun lobby has been triumphant in this debate, right? I think that's a correct statement. So some of their criticisms of your book I've, I've found to be a little odd. And again, you can you can read them kind of different ways. I mean, if you're focusing on how many guns people had, which, you know, you did and the critics have done, maybe then way that's kind of, you know, missing the larger point because, you know, nowadays there are a lot more guns, but gun ownership is, is, is a pretty small percentage of the population. I mean, even now, right? I mean, the vast majority of people in this country do not own a gun. Is that correct? Um, the majority do not, but a very significant minority. Uh, the last sure. time I said on this, it was more than a third of the people in this country own firearms. I own firearms. Um, they, they are present in our society, but it seems to me uh, at least what I tried to ar argue in Army in America, that what matters uh, is the ready availability of guns that's created by mass production. So that someone living in the United States in, shall we say, the year 1840, if that person wants to purchase a gun, 
it is a significant investment. It is the equivalent of buying a car. It can represent an entire year's wages, um, depending on, you know, obviously what you do for a living. So it is, it is not something one enters into lightly. Whereas by 1870, and the founding of the NRA is largely in response to what they think is gun ownership getting a little bit out of control. Basically, anyone can buy a firearm. Guns, there was what was called the $5 special comes out in the 1870s. And $5 um, is a week's wages for an unskilled worker. Compare that, you know, if if we do the sort of, um, if we could somehow imagine a constant dollar uh, to buy a gun of any quality in 1840s, equivalent of a year's wages for an unskilled worker, by 1870s is the equivalent of one week's wages. This is really significant change in a society. Yeah, well, and I mean, you, your book goes up to 1877, so you're you're talking about the origins of what emerges eventually as, as, a, as a gun culture, and that has to do with mass production, Western settlement, kind of things getting into popular culture, but also, as you say, guns becoming more available, cheaper, in large part because of the Civil War, because of industrialization, and also just these guys who fought the war, they kind of go home with their firearms. Is that is that part of the story, too? Oh, absolutely. The end of the Civil War, it's just the, the United States is awash in surplus weapons, um, which the government is delighted to get rid of in any way they can. So pretty much... By, let's say, 1867, anyone can get their hands on a gun. Um, They may not know how to use it, which is still an issue. People buy guns to this day without taking time to take uh, pistol classes or to take safety courses uh, in proper firearm use. And to me, as someone who does these things, that is a bad idea. Well, it's it's funny because when I was talking to Dan and, you know, he's writing about religion and you have too. I mean, guns are just so ubiquitous in this culture and the way I mean, I don't want to necessarily compare it to religion. But I mean, I think everybody either grew up in a religious household or maybe was one generation removed from a, a very religious household. I think it's the same. I think it's the same way with guns. I mean, I think just about any white male in his 20s or 30s has probably shot a gun or <laughs> could have picked up a gun at some point. I mean, I've shot guns and stuff too, but I, I mean, it's just so palpable now. And I mean, you walk into Food Lion or Kroger and there's literally 20 gun magazines on the shelf that you can buy. I mean, I think there's, there's no doubt that there's a culture now. So obviously that, that had to come from somewhere. And I mean, you're, that's, that's what you're talking about. Now, I think with the book and what a lot of your critics were worried about, maybe you can talk about this too, was that I think they were worried that your book was going to be used in court cases and there would be kind of actionable evidence that could be used to influence policy, like uh, legislation, whatever. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, like their fears about how the book would be used or how maybe the book was actually being used in court cases? Yeah, I, it never occurred to me. Um, yeah. I did not think that, well, let me, let me start that sentence over. Let me say more emphatically, I absolutely thought that one of the weaknesses in the United States, and I think it still is a weakness, is that historians will work for decades to show that some mythology was absolutely false, and yet the general public still doesn't get it. So, uh, you know, the most striking example of that um, is, of course, Reconstruction. I still, to this moment, recently, last week, heard someone explaining to me that Reconstruction was necessary because of the corrupt black carpetbagger governments after the Civil War. I mean, from W.B. Du Bois on in the 1920s, historians have worked off and on 
to show that is that was not what happened. In the same way, these old arguments about how slavery was a benign institution or how the Civil War was the product of a state's rights debate, these are nonsense positions that cannot be sustained from the source documents at all. Yet people still believe them. So when I wrote Arm in America, I thought, I really do believe that I was making a step forward for scholarship. Other historians would follow upon me, would do ever more research, would qualify what I had found, would correct errors I had made. This is how scholarship is supposed to work. Um, and I figured that maybe 20 years after this book appeared, that people in popular culture would start to wonder if their gun culture had just really appeared like Venus out of the forehead the moment uh, people arrived in Jamestown. But I really thought it was a long-term process. I Maybe the NRA was a little bit more astute than me in seeing that sometimes when you question a mythology, it does catch attention. And I do think Army of America briefly caught people's attention. Um, but it had not occurred to me beforehand. Yeah, well, you know, again, you know, you're talking about things, th this kind of storm that's brewing before the book even came out. I mean, historians are not used to that. And probably at worst, usually with a book, um, I'm thinking of something like Time and the Cross in the 1970s, that debate was really among historians. It didn't kind of bleed bleed out into the the general public. And I mean, certainly your critics, you know, they've been constitutional scholars, uh, people that know what they're talking about, but you kind of see these names repeat themselves among the critics. I mean, even now, these people kind of keep coming back and, and Dan had one of them on the show. So like they really have <laughs> sustained this, this campaign uh, against you. And I'm, I'm not saying they're wrong, but it is, there, there's a certain tenacity to it that you just you don't see among usual usual scholars or, or usual historians no um, i know and it's been very painful I, every time i got a job teaching whoever hired me would start receiving phone calls how dare you hire this person what are you thinking um and all sorts of negative emails and letters would arrive and it's it's remarkable because one aspect of the far right in the United States, which is curious to me, is that they are sore winners. They won the Army in America debate, shall we say. They shut down that discussion of the origins of America's gun culture completely. So why don't they let it go? They won. Um, they want to make sure that no one stands up again and questions. And now all I'm talking about is questioning, I'm not saying even denying, just questioning a mythological version of American gun culture. Well, and I kind of wonder, I mean, why is the history of gun ownership necessary? I mean, I'm not a constitutional scholar, so I don't know how these things work. If there's a ruling based on precedent and in in, you know, going back to 1740 or whatever. But I mean, like, why is it really that important? What matter? You know, what happened in the 1700s to gun ownership now? Why is that significant? Well, it can be significant if one makes an originalist argument within law. In other words, that the original intent of the framers of the Constitution is what should guide our hands. But as Jack Rakoff pointed out in his brilliant book, um, the original intent of the framers of the Constitution was that original intent should not guide the future, that they wanted a Constitution that would respond to change over time. But putting that aside for a moment, if you buy the original intent argument, then it matters in what context the Second Amendment was written. I mean, because what, of course, is much discussed is that the Second Amendment is a single sentence, right? And almost everyone will quote the 
latter part of the sentence, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed, but almost no one quotes the first part of the sentence, which is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people. So in other words, there's a qualifier thrown in, which lays down the, the uh, justification for this amendment, which is we need a well-regulated militia. So if one establishes that at the time that the Second Amendment went through Congress and was sent to the states as part of the Bill of Rights, that gun ownership was limited and was seen more as a duty to the state through the militia laws than a personal preference, then it alters slightly our understanding of the Second Amendment as being not so much about an individual right, but about a collective right that is organized under the aegis of the state. That, I guess, is why it matters to people who are trying to keep the individual right to gun ownership unhindered and unregulated. It seems like both sides can maybe be right in this issue, because, I mean, I think even if you're willing to admit that gun ownership and gun use and violence is as old as America itself, you'd have to also argue that gun regulation is, is as old as America because slaves can't have guns. So, right. so there have been laws that have been passed from the beginning based, you know, obviously for certain reasons. Um, they don't want slaves running around with guns. They don't even want them having, you know, drums and fifes in case there's going to be an insurrection. So I just don't, I mean, yeah, I guess if you're originalist, you're looking for some kind of intent there, but, you know, felons can't, felons can't have guns. I mean, I don't, I don't understand how you can say there hasn't been regulation from the beginning. Well, I don't think one can say that, but one could say, and I actually wrote an article about this for um, Law and History Review, that I argued that the 14th Amendment, in fact, is what truly creates the individual right to own guns. Um, because under the 14th Amendment, every person who's a citizen of the United States is subject to the same due process of law. And so if we agree that individuals can own firearms, we find that right in the 14th Amendment. It still doesn't say anything that the state can't regulate in some way. It doesn't say anything like you can't have background checks, just as a for instance. But it does, I think, um, nationalize individual gun ownership. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and that, by the way, that's not a position, to my knowledge, that um, falls into an easy category on left or right. Yeah. Well, um, I think that'll that'll be a good segue to your new book. But I do want to talk just a little bit about kind of um, after everything that happens with Arming America, you resign from Emory. Kind of how do you sort of work your way back? What, what's your next step after you leave Emory? What do you do? I went to Europe. You went to uh, Europe. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I went and taught in Europe. I got away from um, the madness and uh, just changed my scholarly direction um, through a number of uh, coincidences um, and through the outstanding support of my agent, Dan Green, I then wrote... Um, went back to the subject of violence, essentially, and wrote uh, my book, 1877, on uh, the most violent year in American history uh, that didn't have a war. And um, that was a fun book. I enjoyed doing that research and um, came back to the United States after I would felt that it was safe I, when I stopped getting death threats on a regular basis. Um, and yeah, so... Worked at CCSU and then at Trinity and uh, wrote my People's History of the U.S. Military, which was wonderful. That came out of my uh, experience working with veterans through the Veterans Institute of New England. Um, that was an outstanding experience. And uh, then went to the subject that has probably obsessed me more than any other in my entire life, which is the issue of equality. And so through this all, you're able to keep your same literary agent that you had 
before Arming America. Is that right? Actually, um, Dan became my agent after Arming America. Okay. Dan, an amazing proponent of uh, academic freedom and free speech. And he was outraged at what happened with Army in America. And he contacted me, and it's been a very positive relationship ever since. I respect and admire him greatly and uh, listen closely to his opinion. Well, let's, so let's move on to uh, inventing equality. What can I tell you? Sure. Well, why did you want to write this book? In some ways, it's the book I always wanted to write, and I didn't even know it. Um, when I was growing up, my mother was a secretary, as I mentioned, and she tried on three occasions to gain a promotion and sued for the right to gain a promotion beyond being a secretary, and twice she lost. She, the court where she went to um, said, no, you, it's up to a corporation. If a corporation decides that a woman can't be an executive, that's their choice. And she won her third case um, after the Supreme Court had started a series of decisions applying the 14th Amendment to women's rights. My mother also was a single mother, and um, she couldn't get a credit card until 1971. The Supreme Court had to decide that women could own credit cards in their own name. So I grew up in this context, and I also grew up in the context of uh, living not far from Watts and seeing the Watts riot um, occurring from my school. And when I went off to um, be an undergraduate, I happened to take Paige Smith for the required history course, wonderful historian who based all of his research off source documents and his teaching off source documents. And again and again, I found things that I had learned or thought I had learned in high school to be completely wrong. And then Paige recommended I take the first African-American history class taught at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Blew my mind. Absolutely proved to me that I completely misunderstood the United States and American history. And I think pretty much my whole life I've been obsessed with this notion of why do we claim, as Thomas Jefferson said, that equality is self-evident, yet there is no evidence that anyone really believed that in American history. Or I, that's a sweeping general say, excuse me. There's very little evidence that the majority of political leaders in, in the history of the United States actually thought equality was self-evident. The first president of the United States to flat out say that black people deserved total equality with white people was John F. Kennedy in 1963 in an amazing speech in June of that year. Um, which I remember from watching it on television as a child. Why? What was going on? Why did we proclaim ourselves to be the land of liberty and equality, but we didn't practice it? Um, and I think finally, about four years ago, I decided to sit down and really study the subject. You said four years ago? Yes. So is this, were you spurred on by this from what's happening politically in terms of Trump and... You know, 2016, I started working on it early in the year yeah. because it seemed to me, again, obvious that the very concept of citizenship was being once more weaponized, being used to deny people rights, that somehow there are different statuses of citizenship of which we are unaware. Um, white men have platinum status, and it goes down from there. I couldn't believe that in the 21st century, because as an old guy, the 21st century is the future, right? We are living in the future. We were supposed to progress well beyond the kind of Neand oh, Neanderthal, I just said it, Neanderthal thinking that was so evident uh, in the 2016 election. So yes, that was the spark that really got me researching the subject. And it was fascinating to me and still is. Well, and it's it's pretty disturbing when you think about 
you know, certain people in this country, minorities, African-Americans, women or whatever, if, you know, there's a time machine and you don't know when the, the time is set for, you might not want to go too far back from like 1975, you know, I mean, it could be pretty scary. Um, and I, I was reading something the other day about the 21st century essentially is the first century where black people are either not enslaved or subject to Jim Crow law. And right. Whether they're truly equal, I mean, that's a whole nother issue. Um, but kind of seeing how these debates are still very vital and very present. Um, so I think, you know, in a ways you're going after an evergreen topic here. But I, I'm enjoying the book. I mean, it's well written. I like you have to say about certain people. But maybe just briefly kind of talk about how citizenship is defined in the original constitution and maybe how it isn't kind of what is there that maybe we take for granted that we shouldn't. That's a good question. Um, shortest answer. And one, I think that dodges the question in some way is that the constitution does not define citizenship. It just doesn't say. And that of course is the problem uh, up through the 14th amendment. However, If we just consider for a moment the preamble of the Constitution, which when I was in school, we had to memorize, we the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. I just want to stop right there. We, the people, there is no qualifier there. None. It is we the people of the United States. I think that is a very powerful argument that can be made to suggest that though they do not define citizenship, they were seeking as much as possible within the constraints they understood existed to include as many people in the United States as possible under the blessings of liberty. Remember that? I mean, I just, I've always loved the preamble, ensures domestic, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. What more do you want as a vision for a democratic nation than that preamble? However, the problem is obvious that they never say who the people are. And they unfortunately threw in three convoluted contradictions, those notorious passages that dealt with slavery but did not name its name. It could not be spoken in the document because it would have negated the principles of freedom to have actually used the word slavery. This is what they understood they were doing. And so they went forth with this vague, slight contradiction in the document, and it would set up all sorts of legal problems right through to the 14th Amendment, and not just simply having to do with slavery, but having to do with free blacks, immigrants, women, children. It is just too vague. And uh, new territories also. How do we define those? Just one of my favorite examples in a history of a significant fact that tells us a lot that almost no one knows is that under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which brought the southwest of the United States into the nation, our treaty ending the war with Mexico, the United States promised an immediate acceptance of the New Mexico Territory into the nation as a state with full rights. That promise was not fulfilled until 1912 for the very simple reason that every time it was brought up before Congress, the members of the appropriate committees would say, do you really want a Mexican or a, an Indian sitting next to you in the U.S. Senate or the House of Representatives? Because this territory was majority non-white, and they just couldn't bring themselves to let it into the union until it was majority white. And I think that says an awful lot about how, despite even the 14th Amendment's definition, clearer definition of citizenship, law is always about enforcement. And Congress, unfortunately, always 
interpret, as the Supreme Court did, always interpreted the law in terms of white male privilege. I think that runs right through to the 1930s. Well, and I think, you know, some things we take for granted with citizenship is that, well, if you're born in the United States, then you're a citizen. I mean, that's the way it works now. But that was not the case, right? And Correct. Tani and Dred Scott decision essentially says that black people cannot be citizens, even if they're born here. Right. And they're also, you know, property uh, if they're slaves. But I mean, this idea that we even have now of you're born here, you're a citizen is, I, I don't know, when does that sort of take hold or when is that, you know, the norm? <laughs> um, the 14th Amendment? Lawrence Ferlinghetti uh, just recently died. One of my favorite poems of his was, I'm Waiting for a Rebirth of Wonder. Uh, it's a poem to America that he wrote in the 1960s. Um, when did we establish that all people born in the United States have full and equal rights before the law? I guess in theory we could say the 1970s in a series of Supreme Court decisions and, of course, in the aftermath of the um, Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. But in practice, I would say we still have a ways to go. There are so many examples one can give. Um, one example I give briefly in my book, which I think is worthy of a much more scholarly exploration, is the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act of 1881, uh, 1882. Excuse me. Members of Congress identified a problem, which is that under the 14th Amendment, if you're born in the United States, you're an American citizen. There are Chinese workers out West, and they are not eligible to be citizens unless, this, unless we allow them to be, but their children will be American citizens. So the good liberals of Congress, because that's the way they were seeing themselves. They saw themselves as defending American freedom and American citizenship, is they had to make a choice. Either we violate our own constitution and create a caste system under which the children of certain immigrants cannot become citizens, or we simply exclude them entirely so that there's not the danger of them becoming citizens. And so they went with the latter choice because they were liberals. They excluded all Chinese immigrants to the United States, so they would never be Chinese citizens. And that law was not repealed by Congress until 1965. Well, and I think, too, after living through the last four years of the Trump era, you were seeing, again, this debate really heat up again in terms of you know, who has a right to be here, who can be deported. And I mean, you would hear these stories about people being deported to countries that they had never set foot in. I mean, yeah, they don't speak the language. They... Right. <laughs> so if you're, if you don't have a right, if you, if you don't have a right birthright citizenship, I mean, who are you supposed to be a citizen of? Right. This is a, again, this is why it's a uh, issue, not just simply in the United States, but basically around the world, because every country is going to be confronting this matter more and more. Um, I, at least I think that's a fair statement, in the future. And the United States is itself still a little bit uncertain of the degree to which we want to interpret the 14th Amendment in a literal way. I mean, we can easily take the Justice Taney point of view and say we can interpret it pretty much any way we want, and we can say when they said all persons, we of course only meant white people. Um, that is pretty much the attitude that has guided uh, far too many people in this country for far too long. Well, we, we see this sort of persistence of people that think freedom is whatever white men think it is. And Correct. We've got to... Again, that is weaponizing the 14th Amendment. That's weaponizing citizenship. We get to decide and we get to use it to deny yeah. rights to others. Yeah. Well... Uh, maybe it's kind of a last question. I, I want to um, do a comparison here since you've you've written about gun culture and gun violence and you've written about this the struggle for equality. I think in seeing the, the Black Lives Matter protests, the, the monuments coming down to Confederate leaders and stuff, there's certainly been a reckoning with our racial past and how we achieve justice and equality. 
with the gun debate, I mean, there's another mass shooting today. These things just keep happening. Do you think there's been more of a reckoning with our racial past than there has been our gun owning past? If that makes sense, do you think? Wow, that is a really good question. Um, I would say yes, that there has been more of a reckoning with our racial past because there is there are groups that are pushing the entire nation to confront the reality of our history. Whereas in terms of gun culture, there is no significant subset of America that is pushing the rest of the country to confront reality of its history. There is only the occasional historian who they can easily silence. Um, I will say one of my favorite books of the last few years is by a philosopher who lives in Berlin. Her name is Susan Nyman, and she wrote a book called um, "What the German: What We Can Learn from the Germans." What we can, I think, it is what the Germans can teach us. I'm blanking. Ah, uh, learning from the Germans. That's what the title is. And okay. he compares the way that post World War II Germany confronted its Nazi past and tried to make restitution and to apologize for their collective responsibility. I want to emphasize that word responsibility. Um, that even, you know, again, people are alive in Germany today, the majority of the people who are German citizens, they weren't, they never experienced Nazi, Nazi Germany. But polls indicate that the majority of Germans feel that they still have a responsibility to the world to atone for the Holocaust and the crimes of the Nazis. As Nyman points out, this has never happened in the United States. No one wants to say, no one wants to propose that this country should take responsibility for the crimes of genocide against a native population and the horrific violence that has been directed against not just simply black people, but also Hispanics in the Southwest. And it is way past time for us to just be honest about our history. It doesn't make us less of a people, in my opinion, and in the opinion of this uh, philosopher, it makes us a stronger, greater people if we acknowledge that our nation in the past has done things which we must acknowledge aren't good. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's interesting to see kind of how these these things unfold because after the the Dylan Roof shooting in Charleston, we went into a debate about the lost cause in Confederate history and, and racism. We didn't get into a gun debate. And I know with Parkland, you know, Connecticut, you know, that happened there. Like that has, you know, the Parkland students and everything, they've, they've taken on that fight. But I, 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 you know, for whatever reason, people are more willing to get out in the streets about racial justice. And I, and I think that's a great, that's a good thing, obviously. But with the gun debate, it's, it's become, it, you know, that's a different, it seems like that's a different fight for people uh, than this other one about racial justice. So, uh, so I think sometimes we have trouble with multitasking in this country. And I don't know what, you know, is going to really unfold. It's every time a Democrat is elected, the NRA worries that their guns are going to get stolen and stuff, and it never really happens. Um, but I'm hoping, you know, we can sort of do everything and keep our eye on the ball in terms of what, what what we need to to make this country a better place because I mean I have kids in I have kids in school I worry about gun violence but I also live in Richmond and it's got a, a racial legacy here so there's a lot of work to do and um, you've obviously taken on some big topics I um, just really quickly are you working on something new do you have new research and a new book in the works. Always. Yes, I'm working on a, uh, a book that explores the ways in which the United States essentially becomes a different country every 50 years. Its very identity shifts every 50 years, which is this wonderful, I mean, it's, it's essentially what Walt suggested was the 
greatest strength of America is our ability to reinvent ourselves. And if we could only reinvent ourselves according to our initial stated values, we would be a beautiful country. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To be that country is a beautiful ideal. Yeah, it's it's a never-ending process, that's for sure, and will give us historians something to, to keep writing about. And oh, yes. So did you say, are you teaching anymore? Are, are you still teaching? I am totally retired. Okay. I'm blissfully <laughs> enjoying Social Security. That's good. And, and like that. And uh, it's wonderful. I recommend it to everyone. Have you gotten the vaccine yet? Oh, yes. Thank you for asking. And good. I get my second shot in just a few days. And I'm looking forward to uh, once more annoying all my friends with my many uh, eccentric ideas about American history. Sure. Yeah, it's going to be a little jarring when I just start doing the simple things again, like going to a movie or going to a restaurant. Um, but hopefully soon. But maybe I think a lot of people have learned... Um, a great deal about themselves in this process, as well as about the United States, and discovered inner strength and connections with neighbors that they didn't even know they had. Um, I, I, I like to see some, I, I believe there are positive results to these experiences um, that we can build upon. And the very fact that the Black Lives Matter movement grew so quickly um during 2020 during the lockdown i take as something truly notable and to celebrate yeah for sure i was pretty amazing to see and i mean, i was really at ground zero here in richmond and we still have robert e lee up and not exactly sure when that's coming down but no i mean this is certainly a an amazing time to to be alive and what we're seeing in a lot of ways is 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 pretty uh, unprecedented. I mean, it was unprecedented. It was unprecedented with Trump, but also unprecedented with the protests and and what came out of that. So, uh, I like to stay hopeful. And <laughs> yes, well, what do we have if we don't have hope? I don't. Right. I can't imagine. Yeah. That we can enjoy life unless we have hope that it, the world would be a better place for our children. Yeah. So do you at once? You know, maybe COVID everyone's vaccinated. Are you going to go out and do book talks or do a tour or has COVID I, kind of run? I have out? no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know. I, uh, I, I enjoy the writing a lot. I yeah. kind of shy in front of people. <laughs> now I hear that. Um, so for introverts like me, this has actually been really good in a lot of ways. Maybe exactly. it's too, too good. It hasn't bothered me in the slightest in some way. <laughs> well, you, you my friends, but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you've stayed productive, so thank you. More power to you, and and Michael. Well, good luck with the book, and good luck with everything, and and thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. Pleasure, Colin, and I really like what you're doing with the um, master class. I think that's a extremely important subject oh thank you um i've, I've had a few run-ins with internet trolls uh but that's kind of <laughs> died down it comes with the territory i guess but um yeah well thanks again michael and, and i'll let you know when this it's is great pleasure talking to you all right that was my talk with michael belial i hope you enjoyed that check out his most recent book inventing equality Reconstructing the Constitution in the Aftermath of the Civil War. That is from 2020, and you can get that on Amazon and everywhere else you can get books. And you can also check out my book, Marching Masters, Slavery, Race, and the Confederate Army during the Civil War, available through University of Virginia Press. There is a new copy online that's $34.95, but uh, probably with shipping and handling, you just might as well get the the regular Amazon version, which is $39.95, but you can also you can always contact me for a cheaper version, brand new. I can sign it for you and ship it to you. But uh, 
you know, if you just want to do the quick thing and get it from Amazon, that's fine too. It did sell a couple books the last week or so, so that's nice. The sales do trickle in, and I am anticipating a check from University of Virginia this year. Finally, it's been a couple years, and working on the Johnny Cash book, making some progress, almost done with the most recent round of revisions, the entire manuscript. But I got to go back through and do a bunch of other stuff. And hopefully my editor's not getting too worried or annoyed with me. But uh, last night I had to work at Hampton, Sydney, and I got home around 6 and was trying to do some work on the manuscript later in the day after putting the kids down, after taking my walk, and got through a couple pages and then just started spacing out. I was, I was so exhausted. So it was kind of a busy week and a exhausting week. Wednesday felt like it was... Pretty much a Friday, like I was done, I was, I was toast. But uh, the week didn't end there. So today, though, is is finally Friday, and looking forward to the weekend. The weather is beautiful today, in mid 60s here in Richmond. Spring is full on. I'm trying to figure out our lawn mowers and get the damn lawn mowed. But we have been having lawn mower issues year in and year out, one constant around here. So. Enough about me, enough rambling. I hope you're doing okay. I'll be back with you soon, much sooner than last time. I will be back with a new podcast, a new interview, and an interesting guest. A New Englander. All right, I'll be talking with you soon. Take care. Bye.